Welcome to the Lens Journals Podcast. I'm Ryan Hill. We've got kind of a special episode today. For a while now, we've been wanting to do a feature on drone pilots, but it was tough to know where to start because drone piloting can mean so many different things to so many different people. Industries from real estate to firefighting are now using drones in nearly countless applications. And as reliable autonomous flight comes closer and closer to becoming an everyday reality, drone use will only continue to grow. So, while we'll never be able to cover every facet of a topic this broad, we figured we'd expand our scope a little bit and interview multiple people for a more varied look at the current state of drones. Our first guest is Elena Buenrostro, and we're starting with her because every pilot I'll be talking to for this episode is a member of an organization she started. Elena is the founder and CEO of Women Who Drone, an international collective of female drone pilots. Their mission, through education, through community, and through content partnerships with companies like Getty Images, is to inspire more women and girls to take up drone piloting. And, as you'll hear, their members work in just about every field where you might find a drone pilot. Elena Wayne Rostro, thank you so much for joining me. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Tell me about your organization, Women Who Drone. Absolutely. So Women Who Drone is an online platform and community that inspires, educates, and empowers women and girls with drone technology. A few of the ways we are doing this, uh, we are inspiring women and girls with our content that we post on a daily basis. Uh, We also share our pilot spotlights that encompass stories of women around the world who are flying drones either for their careers or as a hobby. Uh, We also educate uh, using our Uh, online platform with our virtual workshops. Currently, we also used to have in-person and uh, group workshops, which we uh, have put on hold at the moment. Uh, And then we are also empowering women and girls by providing career opportunities, uh, connecting them with each other through our Facebook group uh, community, as well as uh, sharing passes to various conferences around the world. About how many members do you have? Uh, Right now, we are nearing, specifically in our Facebook group community, we have about 1,800 members. Uh, So these are women who join the Facebook group to either learn from each other, share their content, share their tips and tricks, or also share career opportunities with each other, Uh, previously meeting up with each other to fly drones together. This, This is where all of the conversations are happening amongst our community. And what inspired you to start? Great question. So uh, it all goes back to, believe it or not, the Great Wall of China. Uh, So about early 2017, I wanted to hike the Great Wall. It's something I've always wanted to do since I was a little girl. Finally, when I set out to do it, I knew I was going to document my experience as a professional video producer. Uh, So I was preparing myself for my trip. Um, It was my first solo trip. I started doing some research. I came across drone technology and I knew it was going to be quite difficult to uh, capture the Great Wall. So I wanted to figure out a way to get my camera in the sky. And I realized that a drone was going to be the way to do that. So I purchased my first drone in early 2017 and went to the Great Wall, filmed it, fell in love from there and continued to fly. Um, Soon thereafter, I had a number of women reaching out to me on social media, asking me for tips, uh, what kind of drone they should purchase, uh, how to get started. And that sort of made me think about, you know, different women who were interested and I didn't have all the answers. So I started to do some research and found that at the time there was less than 4% of women who were certified drone pilots in the U.S. And um, that made me think. So I started Women Who Drone in October of 2017, really as a way to just meet other women who were flying drones around the world and to share content, share tips, but also connect all those women to each other so that we can share our knowledge with one another. And then that shortly turned into the education portion with our workshops and our lessons and then our website. And then it was sort of history from there. That statistic jumped out at me when I was doing my research for this, that, uh, 4% of licensed drone pilots are women. Why do you think that is? Yeah, that's a good question. I was thinking about that at the time. And um, actually, just sort of an update there, I was looking at the 
the FAA Airmen Statistics, which is updated every year. And that number has uh, rose to 7%, I want to say. I think I just, I literally just looked this up a couple of weeks ago. It's either 6 or 7%. And yeah, I think it really has to do with storytelling and those inspiring people who might be, you know, flying drones or doing whatever it might be that young girls might not be interested in because they don't see a role model in that particular role, which is why it's so important for us to go to these schools and share these stories with a younger generation to share that this could be a potential field of work for them. And uh, drones really are the future. And there are so many different use cases. But once they see these stories and we share the different ways drones could be used, they feel quite inspired after watching the videos. And then afterwards, they want to go outside and fly them. And after they have actually flown the drone, they want to get their hands on them again. So I think it's really from starting with that inspiring part, sharing these stories, then getting their hands on the technology, and then kind of taking it from there. Education-wise, that's really interesting. I think one of the things that stood out to me when I was starting to look into all of this was how many varied professions that the pilots in your organization are involved with. I'm obviously coming to this, and I think a lot of our listeners are probably coming to this from uh, the perspective of like videography and photography, but it's uh, way farther reaching than that. Could you talk a little bit about some of the varied fields that are represented by your members? Yes, definitely. Um, So we have women who are using drones, again, for different purposes. Um, Like you said, there is photography, there is videography, and that's a great way to start. But after you really have gotten your hands on drone technology, you start to really understand that there are more ways you can use this uh, piece of technology, including, again, mapping. You can um, use something like Drone Deploy to map out a farm to understand you know, aggregation and where you might need to water certain crops. You can uh, attach uh, LIDAR technology to a drone so that you can measure, let's say, forests. Um, There's a company called Drone Seed that is planting trees in different uh, forests that have, you know, had their trees either burnt down or cut down. Let's see, the, you know, the list goes on and on. You can inspect bridges, you can inspect buildings, there's facade inspections that are currently taking place in New York. These use cases are continuing to pop up every single day. I think people are thinking of new ways to use drone technology just to make things a bit safer, but also a bit more efficient. Well, I know you've, you know, wisely uh, canceled any in-person events, but do you have any uh, online events or resources uh, coming up that you're excited about? All of our events will be available on our um, website. We update that on a weekly basis, um, but pretty excited for some upcoming virtual workshops we're going to be planning for uh, 2021. Perfect. And we will uh, link to that in the show notes. Uh, Elena, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. And again, uh, please reach out if you have any questions and check out all of our social channels with all of these inspiring uh, pilot spotlights that we're sharing on a weekly basis. You can find more information about Women Who Drone at www.womenwhodrone.com or on their Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube pages, all under the name Women Who Drone and all linked to in the show notes. Next, I'll be talking with Catherine Appel, a commercial drone photographer and videographer. Her work is primarily action sports and nature-based for clients like GoPro and Red Bull. If, like me, you're coming to drones from the perspective of a traditional photographer or videographer, her work is probably the closest to what you've shot yourself. Just, you know, cooler and better. She has a ton of great advice for integrating drones into a commercial workflow. Catherine Appel, welcome to the Lynn Journals podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you so much for having me, Ryan. Excited to be here. Can you tell me how you got started doing commercial drone work? Yes, of course. Um, I got started just with an interest in drones back in, I think it was the Phantom 2 or Phantom 3, whichever version didn't have the signal sent to the camera. And I just kind of started developing this love for drones and the possibilities that visually it could provide. And kind of as I 
developed my skills and became more confident as a drone pilot. It's something that I was able to organically start uh, integrating into my work. And it was kind of, I was at the early stages of building my career as a photographer and filmmaker. And, you know, to me, having a drone as kind of an added production value add was a huge asset. And at that, in those days, it was still something very new and something that hadn't been kind of widely, I guess, commercialized yet. And Mm -hmm. so it was just a really fun, yeah, fun time to get to be experimenting with it. And in in the early days, so kind of before a lot of the regulations (laughs) that are in place today were in place and just kind of, you know, a lot more freedom and a lot more um, kind of just discovery and excitement for me personally around the possibilities. And you were a working commercial videographer and photographer before you started working with drones, correct? Um, I mean, it it was all very similarly similar time frame. I was I started my career as um, working as an actual actually production coordinator and producer for other filmmakers and photographers, and kind of div- started developing my own passion for shooting and my own kind of creative work on the side to a lot of the production work I was doing, and as I kind of grew in my own creative work and workload, you know, eventually I made the jump and transition from working more on the production management side to creative side. But it was definitely, I'd say very close in time frame to when I was just starting shooting and just starting my own kind of creative business. I'm glad you mentioned you worked as a production coordinator. I wasn't aware of that. Yes, yes, I did. Actually, I thought I wanted to be a film producer when I went to college. (laughs) I wish I had had more experience doing that when I started kind of working as a freelance videographer. I I think that sort of thing, you know, the the planning aspect and all of the responsibility that comes in pre-production there, I imagine that must have been helpful experience to have, especially in the kind of work uh, you do uh, when you eventually got into the more creative side. Yes, I think it was definitely a huge leg up in the sense that I made sure to work for and surround myself by people who I saw were running successful, sustainable businesses and not just running successful businesses, but who I also admired greatly creatively. That was, I mean, just an, I, I'd say integral step in ultimately being able to build a sustainable career myself because I was able to see how someone else was able to do it. And so much is said for mentorship. And I'd say, you know, it wasn't exactly, you know, mentorship relationships, but I definitely feel like I gained a lot of, I guess, education and knowledge just from, yeah, working for others. And what percentage of your work today would you say involves drones? I would say probably 25%. And in most cases you're using, um, you're using a drone as, say, a tool on a more traditional shoot most of the time. You're, you're not working on many projects that are drone exclusive. Correct. Yes. And even, I mean, some, on occasion I will be hired by like a friend who's a director as the drone operator. But I'm, you know, I'm not trying or attempting to run a drone business that, you know, that's a whole another set of <laughs> challenges that come along with having a you know, drone specific business. And there's on those bigger shoots that require that level of precision and flying, I will contract out other companies or other pilots. I'm a competent, confident pilot, but I also know the scope of my, my uh, skill levels and I, I can provide the, an added level of production value, but I'm, you know, not going to be the tight chase FPV pilot on a shoot because that's just not my my specific skill set or skill level but I do greatly greatly enjoy drones and geek out hard anytime I get to work with other pilots and learn from them and collaborate with them my next question is a super broad question but what do you think are important ways to make your work stand out to commercial clients and just so it's not too broad let's say drone work specifically Like you said, when you started, it was a pretty niche thing and it was kind of the Wild West and maybe a little bit difficult to get into. But now I think the technology is a lot more accessible. So much is so accessible. Yeah. 
basically, if you have three hundred dollars, you can market yourself as a drone pilot to a commercial client. How do you think you can make your work kind of stand above the crowd that way? That's a really good question. I think, I mean, obviously, a base level and understanding of the principles of photography and video are essential. Understanding when to use an ND filter, how strong of an ND filter you'd want to use, why you'd want to use that. Um, and then understanding kind of the, you know, basics of composition. And, you know, from there, I think developing those skills into more hard piloting skills where experimenting and seeing what kind of movements are engaging and what kind of movements are visually captivating. And, you know, you obviously always want to be capturing shots that especially in film like will you know ultimately serve your story but understanding how to operate a drone in a manner that is smooth and creates visually engaging and captivating footage is ultimately always the goal and so I think kind of working to try and develop an understanding of what those types of shots look like and I mean now there's so much technology surrounding creating you know you can hit a button (laughs) and the drone does a lot can do a lot for you but I think at least understanding on a primary level what types of shots whether it's you know some kind of a parallax move or what kind of shots are visually engaging is a really important first step and then obviously learning how to best execute that follows closely after have you had any particularly challenging shoots lately Um, the shoot I did over the summer with Red Bull in collaboration with Johnny FPV, he was our drone pilot and I was a director of photography on the shoot. It was, I guess, challenging technically in a handful of aspects because, you know, we had a intro shot that was shot on a red that needed to cut flawlessly and seamlessly into an FPV shot and kind of, you know, coordinating and choreographing a shot that could seamlessly transition and then also um, working with our post house to figure out you know what are the optimal settings on this for the specific shoot it was um, in partnership with DJI so you know we were shooting with the Osmos and figuring out what the optimal settings was to give our post house the most I guess latitude in both color and post stabilization everything to you know ultimately deliver on what visually everybody had in their head, kind of coordinating all of those different elements was, you know, definitely had its challenges. But figuring out those problems and troubleshooting that and kind of learning along the way is one of the things I love doing what I do. And so it's, I wouldn't say it was, uh, I mean, it was definitely technically challenging in many regards, but that was what made the job, I guess, so exciting and fulfilling for me at the same time. I'm glad you mentioned imaging settings because I noticed. So if looking through less professional work that combines drone footage with footage shot with a more traditional camera on the ground, you can often, not just from an angle, but from the color and quality of the footage, tell what was shot with a drone and what was shot with a cinema camera. And your work on your website, it's remarkably consistent between drone footage and video camera or even still camera footage. Do you have any particular techniques, either in pre-production or in post, for how you match those cameras so well? Um, I would say I mean, learning some basics on coloring is important, and always kind of for me personally, shooting in log, or I think in like a lot of drones, it's decine like, or I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I'm blanking on the exact whatever the most log like setting is. Right. Everybody has their own weird internal term. But yeah, I think you're I think you're right. I think DJI is is cine like D or D cine like something like that. Mm -hmm. And then obviously, you know, if something that is important in selecting your drone is finding a camera that has as high bit color as you can, because that ultimately gives you the most latitude in post and latitude in coloring the footage. And and again, that that's why I'm also hesitant to say always shoot log is you know if it's a camera that doesn't like in some a lot of my older drones that were lower bit in terms of color 
it was a lot harder to actually grade them well when it was shot more log like because you didn't have as much to work with. But for you know any drones today that has you know ten bit color, you'd be doing yourself, I guess, a disservice in my mind to not shoot it log or log like if your intention is to match it with a cinema camera. What drones are you typically using? Um, right now I've been. I've been playing a lot with the Skydio 2, which has been really fun to mess with. And then the DJI Mavic 2 Pro has definitely been a workhorse for me over the last, I guess, ever since it came out. But I used to be on the Inspire train uh, with the original Inspire one. And that was for a while my go-to production drone. But once the Mavic 2 Pro came out, it really blew away the camera on my old Inspire one. And so at that point when, you know, it's a fraction of the size, I realized that the route to really investing in an Inspire 2 and going down that path, it was extraordinarily expensive. And the commitment at that level, it just didn't seem to have the the ROI. And at that point, it's I, droning for me has always been something that I've enjoyed. And it's been just a passion that has kind of served itself in the purpose of adding production value to my productions. Both the cost at that point, you know, get a drone at the level that you're shooting full raw and matching, really matching red footage. I re- realized that anything at that level, I would be contracting that out and, you know, keeping it small, keeping it lightweight. When I was, you know, lugging my huge Inspire case on flights across the world, it was just, it was a lot to handle in addition to all the other camera gear. So um, just being able to, you know, throw a small drone or two (laughs) in my bag and, you know, have it a much smaller footprint and an easier to manage element of production has been really wonderful. I, uh, I want to go back because I forgot to check on something you mentioned earlier. You mentioned liking a drone that I am not familiar with. Did you say Scadio? Oh, the Scadio too? Yeah, I am. You haven't uh, played with that one yet? No, no, I'm not familiar with it at all. We we only carry DJI stuff at Lens Reynolds. Ooh, not you'll not have because to... it's necessarily the be all end all. Just kind of we only have the one brand. So I'm not super familiar with anything outside of that umbrella. Uh, what do you like about it? Um, the autonomous. I mean, in so I guess one level of the autonomous flying does make me nervous because I am a control freak, and it's like oh, like you know, kind of letting go of all that control is challenging. But if you, I mean, you should just look up some of the videos, samples of its following capabilities because it's insane. It's, I mean, it's, it's abilities to obstacle avoid and track subjects is really next level in the way it uses AI to kind of map the world and, you know, make decisions on its flight path based off of potential obstacles. I'm just really excited to see what they continue doing because the technology of that drone is really spectacular. Are there any particular like accessories or miscellaneous tools you would recommend for drone operators? Just like stuff to have in your backpack? I'd say, I mean, an ND filter kit is something that is, at least for video, I'd say you can't can't go without. Otherwise, you're, you know, if you don't understand why your footage isn't looking like how you want it to look, that could be could be a reason to check out. Yeah, that's a really good point. I'm not sure, especially beginners, I'm not sure people are always aware that ND is an option for drones. Can you talk a little bit about like why it's so important to have? Yeah, um, and I mean, there, there's a, some you know, sample videos you can take a look at online, but I'm just trying to describe as best I can. Like if you don't, if you're shooting with an ND filter, you're basically often having to shoot at a much, especially in bright sunlight, having to shoot at a much faster shutter speed than you ordinarily would for natural looking motion blur. So sometimes, especially if you're like flying your drone fast or whatever, it can give this like really jittery looking footage. And, you know, if if you're not understanding why it doesn't have like what feels to be a more smooth or organic look, that it very well could be a shutter speed related issue where, you know, if you had an ND filter, you could slow down the shutter speed to double your frame rate, which is, you know, generally the sweet a good sweet spot for natural looking motion blur and it will allow you to capture footage that's much more organic and natural to what you're used to seeing in film. 
Right. Especially when you're cutting back and forth, uh, like you are between uh, stuff shot on the ground with a traditional cinema camera and drone footage, that difference in shutter speed can be really jarring that having those be the same goes a long way to matching that footage. Well, Definitely. And I do think a lot of a lot more we are becoming accustomed to a more action sport cam style look. But I think if you are especially trying to match it with, uh, you know, especially higher end cinema camera. But at that point, I'm I'm hoping <laughs> whoever's shooting it knows better to right <laughs> to, to make that decision. Uh, what advice would you give to a beginner interested in this line of work? I guess I would say. Don't limit yourself in what you shoot and really shoot every and anything and shoot because the more you shoot, the more you can develop your style, the more you can develop your taste, the more you can develop, you know, kind of discover what subjects you enjoy shooting, what kind of situations you enjoy shooting in. And, you know, that helps you find your path. And I think something I've heard many times throughout my career is the more you fail, the faster you know what doesn't work the next time around. And oftentimes that is, you know, one of the things that will separate a professional from somebody who is an amateur is having failed many, many, many more times so that they inherently know how to get the end result much faster. (laughs) And the faster you fail, the faster you grow. So I'd say don't be afraid to, you know, get out and fail more. (laughs) Well, Catherine, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. You're welcome, Ryan. I appreciate you taking the time to chat with me today. You can check out Catherine's work on her website at catherineappel.com. That's C-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E-A-E-P-P-E-L.com. Or if you want to be really jealous of her job on Instagram at Catherine Appel. We'll take a quick break and be back with more of the Lens Rentals podcast. If you only know Lens Rentals from our yelling about cameras on the internet, there's more to the story. We're actually the largest online videography and photography equipment rental house in the entire world. Cameras, lenses, lights, audio, drones, just about anything. Here's how it works. Just go to lensrentals.com and tell us what you need and when you need it. We ship it straight to you in protective cases. You use it for whatever your heart desires, then ship it back to us with the included return label. Next time you need equipment for a shoot, head to lensrentals.com slash podcast for a discount on your order. That's lensrentals.com slash podcast. Welcome back to the Lens Rentals podcast. We're talking to multiple pilots about how drones are used in various industries, and one of the industries where drone use has increased the most is real estate. My next guest, Emily Hines, is a licensed pilot who left a career as a professional skydiver to found her own aerial real estate photography company. Emily Hines, thank you so much for joining me this morning. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, Tell me about your company, Buzz My Property. Buzz My Property was founded by me in 2017. It started off uh, with a friend who came to fly a drone in my yard. Um, I had not come across drones before. I kind of heard of them, but hadn't touched one, seen one, or flown one. And prior to that, my my love of aviation, if I go back a couple steps, started um, very young. I was paragliding. I got into skydiving competitively for a good number of years and then got my manned aircraft pilot's license. Um, and so I've always sort of had a love for flying and being in the skies in in some form or other. But when I had kids and got married, that sort of changed a little bit. My priorities changed and I wasn't able to fly as much as I wanted to. So when he turned up in my yard with this drone and started flying everywhere, I was able to quickly fall in love and rekindle a passion that possibly was more family friendly that I would be able to do, you know, without taking as much perhaps money and time as manned aircraft flying tends to do. Uh, so he edited this video. He was taking shots in my pool. We were going up, we were going down. I, I, you know, he let me fly it and it was really exciting thing to get into. And we had a couple of beers that night and showed my neighbor the video that we'd taken. And she said, Oh my God, this is amazing. I would absolutely pay for that. I have realtors who I work with and they would pay for this service on houses that they sell. So we kind of talked it over and I said, let's do it. Let's start a business. And my friend didn't want any part of the admin side of it, the you know legal, the financial aspect. The, he just wanted to fly, and and that's kind of how we got started. 
And then very quickly, I got my own license 107 cert- certificate and, you know, became chief pilot of, of my own missions now. So it's very much a, a small company run by me, but I'm picking up popularity in the local area. And I have a good number of regular clients who, who come back to me on a regular basis. And it's me kind of doing my thing. And were you involved in real estate at all before you started or did you come to it from drones to real estate? Uh, not at all. So I came to it very much from an aviation background and had a, a quite steep learning curve to figure out that it's all fun to fly. And obviously that's where my passion lies. But in order to be successful in this line of business, I really had to step up my game and learn about photography. I wasn't quite aware of how much goes into the post-production process and how to edit your photos, but even back to basics of the exposure triangle and ISO and shutter speed and aperture and all these things that I had heard about, but didn't quite appreciate the importance of. Um, So it was a steep learning curve. I didn't know anything about real estate and I certainly didn't know anything about photography. So, you know, bit by bit, you build on your business and you take it one step at a time. And I've now learned more about real estate and a lot more about photography, which is helpful. What do you think your clients are looking for specifically in drone photography or are there Uh, techniques or skills that you've had to uh, learn that are specific to real estate photography? That's a great question. Yeah, I think that real estate aerial photography has certainly grown, um, certainly in the time that I've been working. And I think the key at the moment to stay in business is to diversify. It's not just, you know, still photos of this house or this property that people are looking for anymore. They want the Matterport, you know, 3D um, imaging. They want to get a 360 degree, almost fly through. I, I partner with another guy who um, does some some fly throughs inside the property with teeny tiny drones. Um, I work with somebody who takes almost like a doll's house image and you can, f- you can virtually fly your way through the house on the ground inside the house. You know, video is obviously a, a, an option outside. You can take stills, but you can also take videos. I work with one guy or spoke to one person who um, is since COVID has developed a way to virtually stream live the indoor and outdoor drone photography that he's doing because his clients are not traveling as much anymore and they want to have a good idea of what the house is like both inside and outside. So he's got an app that he virtually live streams what it, what the drone can see and he's talking to them on the phone to the clients while he's doing this so they'll say can you fly down the street and show me that school on the left he's like sure and then they go you go inside the house and show me the bathroom that second time and so you know the, the answer to your question is yes there's a there's more and more skills that are being demanded in order to meet the needs this is a, a very much it, drones as a whole is a growing industry still. It's very much in its infancy and there's a lot more applications and a lot more ways that drones are being used. And as far as real estate photography goes, I don't, I personally don't have all the skills that are required to satisfy each and every client because the demands are growing and they keep coming up with more creative and interesting ways to capture these properties and how, how to uh, show off and, and from a marketing standpoint, what this house has or what this property has over and above another one. So I think the key is to diversify and to subcontract and work with other people who can bring in skills to your team so that you're able to cover each and every aspect that your client essentially is asking for. Do you remember any especially challenging projects? (laughs) Yeah, I've had (laughs) had quite a few of those. Um, I love a challenge. I like to, you know, throw myself in the deep end. I have had uh, some challenges. Do you know what? One of the challenges I find, which I wasn't expecting, is that a lot of my clients haven't worked with drone photographers before. So, you know, this industry, again, is still very new. And I'm having to educate some of the realtors I work with and indoor photographers and some of my partners on how to work with me because a lot of them are excited by the drone and they want you to show them how it works and, you know, they'll have a crew of people around them and they'll do it when there's showings. And I don't want any of that. When I'm coming out to do a real estate photography shoot, I don't want cars in the way. I definitely don't want people in the way. And ideally I just want to focus on my job and not 
have crowds of people standing around me pointing at the drone. So, you know, we've had to educate the clients on trash day. And if you're having carpets moved in or moved out because you're selling your home, then definitely don't call me on that day. Like, let's book it when there's a nice clean area for me to fly around. So that was one challenge I wasn't expecting is just, you know, the the realtors and the and the clients need some help in understanding how this works. It's a new element of photography to them. But also, yeah, I mean, I've had I've had jobs where there were technical challenges, where the drone uh, perhaps is in a no-fly zone if you're flying DJI products, um, you know, and you've done your checks and you are in clear airspace and everything's looking good, but then you get to site and you're very close to the delimitation and then the drone says, I'm not going to take off. That's always uh, <laughs> an interesting one. I've had challenges with projects that I simply didn't know how to handle. Um, So I, you know, often will lean on some partners who I work with and get um, their input and contract jobs out to people who have certain skills that I don't have in my team yet. Yeah, I could I could probably come up with some stories for you over (laughs) over some drinks one day. You mentioned your aviation background to go back to that a little bit. Can you give me a little bit more detail on that and how you kind of got started piloting drones from previous aviation experience? Sure. Um, So I grew up in Europe. My mom's French, my dad's British, born in Holland, very kind of uh, nomadic life. I moved around a lot as a kid from country to country and ended up in high school in the Alps in Switzerland. And I could see paragliders from our backyard just flying off these mountains on their big parasails. And I was supremely excited by that. So Turned 16, asked for that for tandem on my birthday. My parents were down and I started paragliding. And that was like the beginning of me opening up my eyes to what it's like to fly, whether it's a fixed wing or uh, unmanned, that that became kind of a, an area of interest, that which then progressed to skydiving. I became a certified um, licensed skydiver and started traveling around the world exclusively skydiving. I took two gap years <laughs> from life and went around the world and traveled and skydived, fell in love. My husband too is a skydiver. So we had that team thing going on. We competed together in the uh, British Nationals in 2006 and got silver, which I'm very proud of. Um, so that was kind of our skydiving career at it at its height. And, and we did that for 10, 15 years, I guess, and then got to the U S shortly after we got married and started having kids, which, um, you know, the skydiving element is, is a risk factor that you take into consideration when a you're pregnant and B you've, you're looking after young kids. So we kind of took a backseat there, but I got into manned aircraft. I, America opened up a whole load of opportunities that Europe didn't, largely through weather and through price. It is so much cheaper here and the weather is so much better to uh, become a, a manned aircraft pilot that that is an easy no-brainer um, if you're comparing Europe to America. So I got my pilot's license here and was flying around as a small family with my husband and kids. And we did Oshkosh and Sun and Fun and all the big air shows and, uh, you know, the $500 hamburger where you get in your plane and fly down to Cape May or whatever and burn $500 in gas for a a small six buck hamburger, but it (laughs) keeps you happy and and you're having a good time. So I did that for a good number of years and clocked up a a few hundred hours of um, single engine land uh, skills and then got pregnant a second time. And now the family's growing. And so, you know, bit by bit, the flying became less of a priority. And I essentially was grounded for a few years because I uh, became my my pilot's license was then no longer current. I'm now uncurrent, as it were, but still love aviation and needed to get back in the skies. So thankfully, you know, drones drones satisfy that need. I'm still very much actively involved with the FAA. I'm actually an FAA safety team representative and influential drones who I work with is a FAA safety team industry member. Um, I think we're the only drone integration company who who is on the fast uh, safety team there as a member. So, you know, I'm constantly using the skills that I picked up through skydiving, through um, manned aircraft flying every day. You know, part of the 107 certificate is airspace. It is weather. It's weight and balance. It's all the things that you do when you're going for your Part 61 license as well. So it's a real pleasure to be able to thrive in an environment that I love first and foremost for flying. But like I said, you know, had to introduce me to a whole other 
load of skills, including real estate and the photography aspect of it. To get into equipment a little bit, I know you you do a very wide variety of work. So I, I imagine the equipment you use varies a lot from job to job. But what are your go to drones or accessories? Do you have stuff that you finding you find yourself using on every job? No, I don't because every job is different. And, um, Mm -hmm. it, you know, I start every job with a pre-flight checklist, which includes what equipment I'm going to need. Sometimes I need additional batteries or I have to rent some gear out. So sometimes I need to check if the external, the exterior of the property has plugs that I can use to plug in various chargers or equipment that I might need. If I, I'm, doing, you know, a a large job, I need a larger drone. If the weather is a specific way, I might need a a drone that can take more winds. If you're speaking strictly real estate, frankly, I have two DJI products that I use. I have a Mavic Air and I have a Mavic 2 Pro. um, And they're kind of my go-to, the Pro more than the Air, I would say at this stage, but that's kind of my go-to drone for your, your more simple real estate photography shots. But through influential drones, I have access to the Autel Evo 2 uh, Pro 8K Dual and a crop duster if we need a crop duster and a Matrice and an Inspire and a whole bunch of other fun drone toys. And, and with those guys, you know, whatever that job demands, if we're doing commercials and TV work, we're probably going to take the Inspire. Uh, if we're working with first responders and public safety and search and rescue, we're going to take the Evo 2 Dual. I mean, every drone has its pros and cons. Every drone is really just a tool in your toolkit. And whatever you need for that job is what you're going to put in your tool bag for that day. So, you know, we carry, like I said, I'm I'm with the FAA safety team. So I am all about having backup drones and having spare equipment and anticipating issues, anticipating crashes. I think that that comes with the background of um, manned aircraft, you're always trying to think a step ahead. What happens if this, what am I going to do in this situation? So that's kind of inbuilt into the way that I think. And that includes the prep and the pre-flight time that I put together. I, you know, turn up with quite a lot of gear anywhere I go. And it may sound like a very simple job, but when something goes wrong, that simplicity is completely gone. So, you know, if you're flying at night, you're going to need a waiver. You're going to need some lights, anti-collision lights. You're going to need some ground lighting and, you know, some radios and a whole bunch of other stuff that maybe during the day you're not going to need. Every job demands its own specific uh, list of equipment. So we go over that before every mission and just make sure we have everything that we need. Do you have any advice for beginners looking to get into this line of work? Yeah, I think don't underestimate what this really entails. Much as at the beginning of our talk, I said, you know, anyone can get a drone and get a license and throw a drone up in there and do it. I think there's a lot more to real estate photography than that. And I think that um, those who don't take the safety aspect of it seriously and, and run a professional business, which is insured, which is licensed, which is certified and which has some experience behind it, will very soon run into some trouble and some you know, murky waters. So I think if you are a novice, practice makes progress. There is no perfect. You'll never, ever be a perfect pilot. You can always learn something new. Every job I've ever been on, I could look through the logs and, you know, share with you things that I've learned on each and every job. It's a, it's a growing industry. So there's excitement and there's room for new ideas, but it's also an industry that if we don't take it seriously and we make too many big mistakes, you know, that freedom will be taken away from us. Flying is a privilege and we are sharing airspace with manned aircraft and they have right of way. Manned aircraft has been there a lot longer than drones and uh, carrying people from one place to the next is more important than whatever our drones at this point, I'm going to say, would be carrying. And by that, I mean like the the toilet paper rolls that I flew over to my neighbor's houses when COVID started or the Easter egg <laughs> chocolate eggs that I carried to my friends, you know, like all of that is, it's fun. Um, but it's very much a privilege. So as a novice flyer, you know, get the certification, but, you know, bear in mind, that's a good point. Like the the certification at this point is purely just written. The FAA 107 is a written test. You can technically be commercially certified to operate drones legally without ever having owned a drone or picked one up. Now, I I, am hopeful that in future that will change and that there will be a hands-on element to it. But 
if you're thinking about starting out in this line of business, you know, buy a drone and play with it and practice and do it in wide open fields and get comfortable with all the configurations and the settings in the app before you take somebody's money and offer to do still photos of that um, shoot, you know, test yourself a little bit and challenge yourself. And are you able to fly very clean, nice routines and, and clear obstacles? And do you have a visual observer who's trained? Do you have a crew who understands what your priorities are and what you're going to be doing on this mission? It's not just, you know, grab a 107, grab a drone and go out and do it. There's a lot more to doing it successfully and doing it safely to that um, than that rather. And if you don't do it safely, none of us might be able to do it at all. I strongly urge anybody who's trying to get into the business to take safety first and foremost as the most important element of what it is you do, whether you're in construction or surveying or mapping or real estate or media or weddings, whatever it is that floats your boat, do that safely and take that safely seriously because, you know, it may all go away if we really mess this up. Well, Emily, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Of course. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Buzz My Property is located in Mount Laurel, New Jersey, and you can see their work at buzzmyproperty.com. Something I was surprised to find during my research for this episode was how many people were advocating for the use of drones in schools. Modernizing STEM curriculum, that's science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, has been a touchstone in educational circles for years now, and drones may be a new way to make some complex subjects approachable for younger students. After all, if autonomous drone flight is going to be the norm in the next decade, we're going to need some people who can write software. Dr. Heather Monthy, my next guest, has over 20 years of aviation and education experience. She has a master's in teaching with a focus on computer science and started her career as an elementary and middle school computer science teacher. She then went on to earn a PhD in information technology and founded Educators Who Drone, a global online community of teachers, parents, and pilots who are dedicated to introducing kids to aviation and STEM disciplines through drones. Dr. Monty, good morning. Welcome to the Lynn Journals podcast. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. So in addition to all of your other projects, it's a long list, you founded Educators Who Drone, and that's what I want to talk about first. Uh, this is an organization that introduces kids to STEM disciplines through drones. Uh, why do you think drones are a good entry point for young people interested in science? Yeah. So, um, about 2015, 2016, that time frame, I was kind of keeping an eye on the drone industry or unmanned aircraft systems industry. And I was noticing that the, the prices of drones were coming down dramatically. And so I kind of thought, you know, we're going to get to this point where drones are going to be available. They're going to be much more affordable and then they're going to be available with software development kits. And so what happened is in 2016, 2017 timeframe, I noticed that there were some drones coming out that were under $100 that you could program. You, they, they came with a software development kit. And I thought, well, this is such a fun and exciting way to introduce kids of all ages and adults as well to all the different STEM disciplines. So science, technology, engineering, and math. There's so many things that you can do with drones. You can learn um, how to program, you can learn how to engineer them, you can learn how to secure them, you can learn about the you know FAA laws in the United States, um, you can learn about aerodynamics, there's just tons of stuff that you can learn with drones. And so I was, you know, th thinking that, you know, there, there, there needs to be a group of, there, I'm sure there are a group of people that are trying to figure this out, how to bring drones into the classroom. And so I, I had this idea um, with, um, a couple of pilot friends of mine, I'm a pilot as well, to uh, create this group. It started out as a Facebook group um, and it's called Educators Who Drone. And it's a, a group of people who are either, they're either pilots, drone pilots, educators, or STEM education advocates. And the idea is, is just forming a community around people who are trying to bring drones into the classroom to introduce kids to STEM education and it's not just US-based. US We've got people in the group from all over the world. 
um, and it's growing and I'm very excited about it. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be here today to talk about it. I'm, I'm curious what form these programs take. Is this, you know, where people have enacted it successfully, is this primarily like a formal education within a school or are these after school groups or clubs? So it really depends on each individual school and it depends on things like budget and administrator support and even just physically where the school is located, um, just because it's in the U.S. anyways, there's certain um, airspace guidelines that you have to follow. So if your school's within certain airspace, you know, you've got to you've got to take that into consideration. So for every individual school, it really just depends. A lot of schools have had some really good luck uh, bringing this on as an after school program. You know, of course, getting funding is can can be difficult just because, you know, you know, if a drone costs 100 bucks and you want to get, you know, 10 of them, you know, you're dropping a thousand dollars just on equipment right there. So, you know, it's getting the administrator support and then getting that financial support. So, you know, you can start it out as an after school program, finding the kids who are interested in this. Some teachers have brought uh, drones into their to the regular classroom. So they're bringing it into like a science class is where I've seen it quite a bit. Um, and also e- even in the technology space. So, uh, you know, with, with learning programming and learning you know, some, the engineering skill sets, that kind of thing. So that's, you know, it, it, again, it really depends, but it could be an after school program. And I've seen a lot of people bringing it in and into the science and technology classes. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but I, I think something that is being learned in the educational field in regards to these STEM disciplines, especially things that maybe not have been part of a traditional uh, science curriculum in the past, things like learning to code and robotics and these kinds of more uh, advanced and computer related skills. It seems like people are learning that this is not something to save for like a senior in high school. Does that make sense? This is these are skills you can start learning at a much younger age than maybe people would have thought a few years ago. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. What is a good age range to start with? Uh, drone education. So um, I, I'd like to frame this just a little bit so you can, so you can cut, so I can answer this a little bit better. So mm-hmm. when I talk about bringing drones into STEM education, there's uh, four different pillars that I talk about, and they are you can build, code, fly, or certify. Okay, so you can build a drone, you can code a drone, you can fly a drone, and then you can get the certification to be able to fly a drone commercially. So when you're talking about, you know, coding, troubleshooting, engineering mindset, building things, exploring, that is something that can be done at a very early age. So, you know, when you're, when you're using equipment that's, you know, costs a little bit of money, you might want to wait till a little bit of an older age group, you know, fourth, fifth grade. Um, But when you're talking about, you know, learning how to code and uh, write programs, that kind of thing, and just thinking through a problem, you can start as young as five or six. And so when we talk about flying the drones, there's some hand-eye coordination that happens there. Um, And again, you're using some kind of expensive equipment. Um, So, you know, you might want to start with a little bit of an older age group, fourth, fifth grade as well. Uh, When you talk about certify, um, so in the United States, the FAA has a Part 107 uh, remote pilot certification to be able to fly a drone commercially. So what what that means is if you're not flying the drone for recreational purposes, um, you're flying it for commercial purposes and need that license. And in order to um, get that license, you need to be 16 years old. So that's going to be a little bit of an older age group. So you can start, you know, teaching the rules and regulations, you know, at a much younger age group. But then for that purpose of taking that test, you know, that's going to happen more at the high school level. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And I'm glad you mentioned the coding thing. I was looking through your blog and uh, in preparation for this interview, and I came across a lot of the material you have about uh, learning to code with drones. And that's something that never crossed my mind as an option. Like in, in all this educational stuff, I had always thought of like, okay, learning to pilot or learning what sort of science can be done, you know, from a drone. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about the coding options and how that all works? Sure. So um, one thing I love about coding with drones is that it brings this very abstract sort of field and makes it more concrete. And what I mean by that is when you're learning how to write a program, there's a lot of things happening behind the scenes in a computer that can be very difficult to visualize and to understand. 
And at a younger age group, you know, kids don't have that ability to think an abstract thought just yet. It's, it's still being formed. And so what happens with drones is, you know, if you are, you know, eight years old and you are, you're writing a program on a computer and then you execute the, the program, the drone actually goes and does what you programmed it to do, whether it was right or wrong, you're going to be able to see exactly what it is that you program that drone to do. So it really helps take this sort of abstract sort of mysterious thing that's happening sometimes behind the scenes in a computer and brings it to life so that you can, that you can see it. So there's, there's one drone that I always recommend to everybody is the Tello uh, EDU drone. And with that there, they have built in a software development kit so that you can, you can uh, download some software right onto your computer, connect your, um, connect the drone right through your Wi-Fi, and you can write a co- write a program and then execute it right from your computer. Uh, it's a little bit of a wonky process to get that to happen. So um, I've been working with a company called Droneblocks, and they um, they have developed a platform to be able to interact with the Tello EDU drone using a lot of different programming languages. So you can teach a lot of different things with uh, with the drone. And it's much easier to just, it, that initial setup is much easier. Could you give me some examples of programming students have done or could do? Sure. So, you know, initially starting out, you're going to start with something called block programming. And so block programming has become very popular over the last couple of years because it it's, it's a sort of a drag and drop Uh, option to learning how to write computer programs. And what that does is it takes away some of the uh, frustrations with learning a programming language. Learning a programming language is a lot like learning, you know, a a spoken language and there's, there's nuances to it. And, you know, if you miss something as simple as a semicolon, um, it it can make your computer program not work. So what happens with block program programming is you just drag and drop these different commands into your program. So it really just takes out that sort of level of frustration that comes with making sure everything is perfect. Um, so you start out with that. And basically what you're doing is you're, you're giving the drone pro, uh, commands to you know, take off. You can have it yaw to the left, yaw to the right, which is turning um, to the left or to the right. Um, you can have it uh, climb and descend by a certain number of feet. You can program it to do all sorts of different maneuvers, and you could do that you know, with this very simple block programming um, platform. From there, once you once you really learn the the fundamentals of coding, and you and you feel like you've got you know the the concepts down, then what you can do is you can graduate to a you know sort of a written programming language. So you can do things with Python and, and some other programming languages that are out there. And what you can do there is. Now you're learning how to code using an actual programming language, but then you can do some really cool things with, you know, with, uh, with sensors, um, you can do stuff with cameras. And so you can start learning more about like autonomous flight. So where you program a flight into the drone and then it goes and executes it on its own. So start with the fundamentals and then you can graduate up to these you know, program languages that are used, they're used in industry. Um, so it's, it's, it's a really cool way to, to, to build those programming skills. Right. Yeah. That's something that struck me. And I can't believe I, you know, thought of this for the first time while researching for this episode, but you know, we're, we're talking to multiple members of the women who drone organization about, you know, different careers available for people interested in drones. And until we got to this section, it didn't occur to me that one of the primary careers would be programming drones for autonomous flight, which I imagine in the next few years is going to be a growing industry. Yes, absolutely. It's, 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 it's not going away. Um, the FAA is taking a lot of measures to make sure that we can integrate drones that are flying autonomously. So with, without somebody, you know, guiding the the drone itself, um, the FAA is taking a lot of measures to make sure that we can integrate autonomous flight into the national airspace system. So that's the same system that you fly in when you are getting on an airline and you're, you're taking a vacation to Florida or you know wherever you're going, that's it's the same airspace system. So we want to make sure that you know these this technology as it's advancing is uh, brought into the national airspace system safely and securely. So there's a huge need for people who you know, understand how to build and and develop this type of technology, but then also understands the environment in which you know these these they're giant flying computers is what they are. And you know, you need to understand that environment in which you're going to be operating. 
Speaking of the FAA, everybody I will have spoken to for this episode is a licensed commercial drone pilot. So everybody's passed that part 107 exam you mentioned, uh, but you're the only one I'm speaking to who's writing a course on it right now. And I, I know it can be a pretty intimidating uh, test, especially for anybody unlike you without an aviation background. As somebody who prepares prospective pilots for that exam, are there particular problem areas of the test that you're finding for people without aviation experience? Yes, definitely airspace. The national airspace system is a very complex thing and it can be confusing and there's a lot of nuances. So learning just the rules of the road or the rules of the sky, I guess, and um, learning how to read the, the they're called charts or sectional charts. So uh, learning how to read you know, essentially what maps that pilots use, right? And being able to interpret, you know, can I fly here? Can I not fly here? And if I can fly here, do I need a waiver? You know, just understanding the, the context of airspace in, in which you're going to fly and what rules are going to apply to you. That's that's really the biggest thing. You know, the, the Part 107 exam uses a lot of questions from the private pilot exam. So there's some things on there that seem a little like, well, why is a drone pilot? Do I need to know this kind of stuff? But you, know, you have to understand that you're operating in the same system that manned aircraft pilots are. So you've got to understand this environment. And so really understanding that is probably the biggest thing that I've seen. Um, so much so that I've actually started uh, putting some videos out on my YouTube channel just to help people just to help people learn this. I, I'm, you know, I'm a manned aircraft pilot. I'm an unmanned aircraft pilot. And I, I want to just help people understand this world um, so that we can all operate it, in, operate in it safely. I know at Lens Rentals, we get a lot of questions from people who aren't sure if they need this certification or not. Can you give me a little bit more detail about the types of drone pilots that need to take this exam and the types that maybe don't? Or should it just be a go-to for everyone? Yes, that is a, a hot topic right now. Um, I think that the best rule of thumb that I have heard, and I, you know, I, I use this, is that if it's not recreational, it's commercial. So if you're not just going out and flying around for your own pleasure, it's commercial. So if you work as a um, as as a realtor, and you want to take photographs of your um, of your properties that you have listed, and it's outside, you need to have that Part 107 exam. Um, if you are flying indoors, so say you are a teacher or you're running an after-school program, something like that, and you're flying drones inside a school gymnasium or auditorium, something like that, you don't need it. So the FAA does not govern airspace inside buildings. They do govern the airspace outside of buildings. And again, if you are flying it's not a recreational flight. It doesn't, money does not have to exchange hands. Okay. So if you are, you know, you're, you're taking a, a video of, you know, a you know, Friday night football, high school football game, it's commercial. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a very gray area, but if you look at it at that perspective, that if you're just not out flying around for your own fun and pleasure, um, it becomes commercial. So then you need to take that exam. I think personally, you know, you know, take, Go through, at least go through a course or, you know, watch videos, um, do a little reading. There's a, the FAA puts out a ton of free resources. There's tons of books out there uh, to learn this world um, so that you can be safe and, and keep everybody out of harm's way. You know, you don't necessarily have to take the exam if you're just out flying recreationally, but, um, you know, it's always good to learn the material and um, know uh, the environment in which you're operating. As far as the prep goes, is everything you would recommend book studying, just reading materials, or is there some particular real world field experience that people should have before they go into the exam? Um, you don't need to know how to fly a drone to take the exam. I think it does help to have a little bit of practical experience, especially with um, things like reading weather charts. That's the part that scared me when I <laughs> when I started thinking about studying this for this thing. As soon as I saw weather charts and no knew that that was going to be part of what I needed to learn, uh, that is what scared me off. Right, and so you know, if you have a little bit of practical experience doing that, versus just like, okay, I got to study for this test and learn how to read these diagrams, you know, it, it's you can only cram so much into your head, right? Like at some point, you got to have some practical experience doing this. So. 
you know, you don't have to have practical experience flying a drone to take the exam. Um, it's a lot of stuff that you can learn via books um, and watching videos. Um, so I, I think videos are helpful just because having somebody sit down and show you, okay, these are the steps that I take. If I'm going to plan out a flight, um, I'm looking at these weather reports. Here's how I'm interpreting these weather reports. Here's how these weather reports uh, apply to the airspace in which I'm flying. Um, it's just helpful to kind of have somebody explain all of that. So, you know, you, you don't have to have practical experience, pra- uh, practical experience flying a drone to take that exam, but I think it does help. Do you have any projects or programs coming up that you're particularly excited about? Yes, I'm continuing to um, build out my YouTube channel. Um, it is just my name. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm trying to put out some content out there to just help people get involved in this and feel like they are getting good information. What I have found is that there's, you know, it's like anything on the internet. There's, Mm -hmm. there's people that are putting out good information and people that are putting out some not so good information. And when you're new to something, it's really hard to discern that, I guess. And so what I'm just trying to do is I'm just trying to help and give back by putting out good information, just trying to help people Um, I've been a manned aircraft pilot since 1997 and a flight instructor since 2002. And, you know, I'm very passionate about this and I just, I want to help people and I want to help people operate um, and fly safely. I, uh, I watched some of your videos uh, to prep for this and I cannot endorse that more highly. I feel like, especially on YouTube, you know, I don't want to throw out any names or even concrete examples, but like you said, it, uh, it can be the wild west a little bit and that there's nobody making sure anyone necessarily knows what they're talking about before they put out a YouTube video. So there's plenty of stuff that's just like, hey, I strapped a 20 pound camera to this drone that can't handle it and flew it into a national park. And there's not (laughs) enough stuff that is just factual information from somebody who knows what they're talking about. So yeah, we'll absolutely be linking to all of that in the show notes. And uh, yes, anybody listening should for sure check this out. Thank you. And Dr. Monthy, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Yes, it was a great conversation. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to the Lynn Journals podcast. Dr. Monthy's work can be found at heathermonthy.com. That's H-E-A-T-H-E-R-M-O-N-T-H-I-E.com. And she has two podcasts of her own, the Simple Cybersecurity Podcast and the Discover Drones Podcast. As always, everything we mentioned here will be linked to in the show notes. We only covered a small percentage of the many industries in which drones are being used. So if you have any particular drone related interests you'd like covered on a future episode, let us know by emailing podcast at lunchrentals.com. The Lens Rentals podcast is a production of lensrentals.com. If you've got a question or topic you'd like covered on the show, email us at podcast at lensrentals.com or leave us a voicemail at 901-609-LENS. That's 901-609-LENS. If you're enjoying the show, please review us on iTunes and subscribe in your podcast app of choice. Make sure to check the show notes for a link to this week's coupon code. And as always, Roger Sokala will leave you with an inspirational quote. Normality is a paved road. It's comfortable to walk, but no flowers grow there. Vincent Van Gogh.